Automation is becoming more prevalent in cyber physical systems, which include our homes, the cities we live in, and the infrastructure that supports our way of life. Over the past 10 years in particular, we've seen automation, smart technologies, start to have a really tangible impact on daily life. But this advancement isn't happening universally. Today I'm going to talk to you about an area where we've really struggled to introduce meaningful automation. That is, urban water infrastructure. My name is Jacqueline Schmidt, I'm from the University of Michigan, and I'll be presenting a user study we've done in Detroit, Michigan, in the United States, of stormwater infrastructure operators, which is specifically focused on why it's been so difficult to bring smart technologies into the water infrastructure control room. Now, the first thing you should know about water infrastructure is that it's operated predominantly manually. If it's raining at 4 a.m. in virtually any city around the world, then that means there's a person in a control room at 4 a.m. who's turning on and off pumps to make sure that the city doesn't flood. These control rooms have to be staffed 24-7, and when it does rain, they get really busy as teams of operators work together to route flows of water across hundreds of square kilometers. Their goal is to make sure that the entire city successfully drains, that stormwater doesn't build up anywhere causing dangerous urban floods. Their other goal is to make sure that the city's wastewater gets treated as much as possible. In cities with older water infrastructure, which includes a lot of Europe, a lot of the eastern United States, stormwater infrastructure is often coupled with wastewater infrastructure in what are called combined sewer systems. So sanitary sewage and stormwater runoff go in the same pipes. As a result, when we get a big rainstorm in these cities, the combined sewer overflows resulting in raw sewage being dumped into the nearest natural waterway. This is a really big source of urban pollution, and it actually happens all the time. The second thing that you should know about water infrastructure is that it's under growing threat. Climate change is resulting in larger, more intense storms, which means we're more often seeing stormwater sewers get overwhelmed. At the same time, we're seeing global trends of urbanization, which means we need larger sewers to meet a growing demand. Rebuilding infrastructure to be larger, as you might imagine, is incredibly expensive. The deep tunnel project, pictured here, cost Chicago about $4 billion, for example. For many cities, rebuilding like this is just not an option. So the industry is turning to smart technologies, robotics, AI, automation, with the expectation that this could be a way to increase the efficiency of the existing sewer at a much lower cost. In practice, however, we're not seeing automation technologies roll out into sewer control rooms. Here's where we stand. We have a massive cyber physical system. It's city scaled, composed of thousands of moving parts. There are hundreds of stakeholders involved in the system's management, from the operators in the control room to field staff and maintenance workers who monitor and fix assets when they break, to the engineers and contractors who develop control plans for how to route water through the city's pipes. Developing these control plans is not straightforward, by the way. These plans are painstakingly designed, but at the end of the day, they're actually really only guidelines. No two storms are the same, and so operators have to look at the data coming in, their sensor feeds, the weather forecast, and make sometimes really high-stakes decisions on the fly. They told us it usually takes about three years for a new operator to become confident and independent in the control room. Now, who's affected by these control decisions? Well, in the case of Detroit, about 4 million residents are served by the wastewater treatment plant. It's actually one of the largest wastewater resource recovery facilities in the world. At this scale, one control room is not enough. In fact, there are more than a dozen control rooms spread across three counties. All of these different control rooms control different parts of the sewer, passing water between each other from upstream communities to downstream communities, all the way down to the treatment plant, where water is eventually cleaned to the point that it's safe to return to the Detroit River. This is the system we want to automate. And as you can imagine, it's not a technologically simple system and it's not a socially simple system. The idea of automated water infrastructure has been bouncing around for over two decades now. It's not a new thing and certain components of the sewer have been more readily automated than others. There are already quite a few automated pumps in the Detroit sewer, for example along with these automated inflatable dams, which have been in place since 2005. These sorts of assets are usually connected to a couple of sensors, they're operated on a level set point basis, 
It's not a particularly sophisticated system, and as a note of foreshadowing, the operators have mixed feelings about them. The holy grail of automated stormwater control is large-scale regional control. This would involve creating a cohesive real-time control system that could optimize water flows across the entire network, so across three counties in Detroit's case. This is where we think that we could see the largest improvement from automation, what we really need to tackle urban flooding and the pollution problems that we have. But it's something that nobody in the world, not even the most advanced sewer systems, has permanently implemented in practice. Since we're looking at such a manual system today, our research question was, why is this happening? Automation strategies that have worked out in other control rooms, such as air traffic control, rapid transit systems, and power plants, are clearly not working out in the water infrastructure space. So we asked two research questions. One, what do control room operators perceive as the major barriers to adoption of smart technologies in the sewer system? And two, what changes to the design or implementation of smart technologies could improve their acceptability to operators? There are a number of fundamental differences in working conditions that you see in the water infrastructure control room as opposed to other kinds of process control rooms. For example, the scale of the system is so much larger, an entire city's worth of drainage pipes compared to a single power plant. By talking to the operators, our goal was to understand what is it about these working conditions that is making it more difficult to introduce new technologies? So we conducted 16 interviews with 19 operators spread across 10 control rooms in the Detroit combined sewer system. We asked questions covering a range of topics, including existing operational procedures and constraints, attitudes towards automation, and perceived barriers to regional cooperation between the different control rooms. We conducted three rounds of interviews, the first was focused on how operators use data, how they interpret information from sources like real-time sensors and the weather forecast. We asked how they use that information to make decisions. Then, in the second round, we expanded the conversation and prompted operators to talk in more detail about their work routines, how their operational procedures are created, how they're starting to incorporate automated systems in their workflows, and what their experience with these early-stage automations has been. In the final stage of interviews, we introduced a scenario-based prototype, a fully functional modeling tool that we developed, which is designed to aid operators in making regionally-minded, data-driven decisions. We used this prototype as a conversation starter, probing at whether there are maybe some intermediate technologies that could help us walk along the path from the very manual system that we currently have to the ultimate dream of system-wide optimized control. After the interviews, we analyzed our transcripts and notes through an iterative qualitative coding process, and then used focused coding to identify core takeaways from all 16 interviews. So what did we find? Ultimately, we picked out four key issues that operators brought up. First, operators don't trust the automated systems that they already have. In some instances, they're even working with utility engineers to roll the automation back and revert to manual control. There are a few reasons why. Number one is that the reliability of what's being offered to them is just not high enough. They pointed out that in their safety critical domain, they have to supervise everything. And they're concerned that if the automated system breaks in the middle of a storm, then they're not gonna be able to fix it. Five of the control room groups also mentioned that manual control is usually more efficient than the automated systems that have been put in place. They accredited that to the limited visibility of the automation. None of their automated systems were holistic enough that they were looking at the weather data, that they were looking intelligently across the system to forecast conditions into the future. That's the way operators are trained to do it. So you get a sense that technologically, the current offerings are not advanced enough. Second, uncertainty in critical data sources limits reliability. I think this is one of the biggest differences that we see in water infrastructure versus other types of control rooms. There, operators mentioned that the uncertainty about when it's going to rain is one of their biggest operational challenges, but also that they know anything built on top of weather forecast data is liable to be inaccurate. Because of this, when the operators are handed a new tool, they need to learn when they can and cannot trust that tool. And building these mental models is forming a pretty strong barrier to adoption. 
So right off the bat, that tells us if we design a new automated system, we need to provide the operators with a really robust analysis of the risks and uncertainties of that system. Third, there's no incentive for operator groups to cooperate with each other. Like I mentioned earlier, the Detroit system is so large that it's managed by multiple control rooms. Currently, the regulatory framework penalizes operators when flooding or an overflow occurs in their section of the system. That means operators are strongly incentivized to protect themselves, to make conservative control decisions, and ultimately dewater as fast as possible and push the risks onto downstream operator groups. There are a number of studies that suggest regional cooperation is needed to improve sewer capacity, but we saw that right now in Detroit, they don't have the regulatory or technological frameworks needed to make this sort of cooperation practical. Finally, system complexity limits reliability. One considerable barrier to developing reliable smart water systems is that knowledge of how the sewer works is distributed across the water utility organization. As one operator explained, in order to make effective control strategies, operator groups need to be deeply familiar with the idiosyncrasies and recent history of their control assets. Encoding this information into an algorithm is difficult. One operator group described how they've tried several times to develop a comprehensive and specific standard operating procedure for their facility, but nobody's been able to do it. Literally, they can't write down the logic. So with all of this in mind, how do we move forward? So far, a lot of the focus in the water engineering community has been on developing smart water technologies that reproduce what the operator can do. Our user study revealed that this is extremely difficult from a technical perspective, and it might be distracting us from a much more achievable set of goals, figuring out how to develop extremely effective human-computer interactions for the water infrastructure control room. So what if instead we turn our attention to providing operators better data tools? In the water infrastructure space, computer interfaces are chronically understudied. The problems that many of the operators brought up visualizing uncertainty, collaborating, and sharing information with other control rooms. These are areas of study that have advanced tremendously since the early 2000s, which is around when many of these water control rooms saw their last major technological overhaul. Now, I don't have time to cover in detail our third stage of the study, where we showed operators a fully functional prototype of an interactive modeling tool, but their response to seeing new data and exploring a new kind of decision-making tool was very positive. Unanimously, operators expressed that they were not only open to, but excited to use new data tools, which stands in strong contrast to their wariness of other smart technologies. Previous control room studies in other domains have noted that giving users a sense of autonomy and control over their system is one of the most important metrics for a control room computer interface. We saw that new data for the water operators was offering a way for them to feel more in control of the sewer. So that recommends a particular path forward. It suggests that there's a huge value in paying more attention to the water infrastructure control room interface. It also suggests that before we try to automate operators out of these control rooms, which might not even be possible, we should instead see whether we can design automated technologies that give operators even more control of what is going on in the sewer. Making this change in perspective might be what's needed to overcome the barriers to adoption of smart technologies in the water space and move us forward to a future where our cities are prepared to handle the extreme weather that's coming with climate change. You can read about our study in a lot more detail. Our paper is called You Can't Write Down the Logic, Bringing Smart Technology into the Urban Water Infrastructure Control Room and I'd be really happy to respond to any questions you might have over email. For now, I'll say thank you so much for your time, and thank you to our funders, the Great Lakes Water Authority and the Herb Family Foundation.